Hello everyone, today we are looking at the continuation and finishing up of what the taxations and the various things that lead to um, the Revolutionary War. So the last thing we were on um, was the Townsend Act and um, the boycotts from, that was the last lecture. So now we're moving on to the Boston Massacre. Um, the Boston Massacre happened in uh, 1770. I'll put that over here for you guys. And really kind of was this uh, a culmination of tensions between the soldiers, the British soldiers, soldiers and the colonists. Okay, the other thing was, I mean, some of this tension was that the British, the soldiers, see, they, you know, kind of sucked for them, too, because they're in these posts and they weren't getting paid a ton, so they really did kind of need to work uh, to help pay for things. Uh, so it wasn't as if, you know, they were going around flush with cash, and then on top of that, decided to see if they could take people's jobs in the process, too. Um, they needed money. They needed work as well. Uh, many of them didn't even want to be there. You also had, uh, merchants profits that had, um, uh, declined in the process and all of this, uh, along with a sense of liberty, uh, cause they play a role in this. Sons of Liberty. Remember they're the more radical group. All right, so they um, push for and certainly encourage, and we'll see Paul Revere is uh, was a son of liberty, and Paul Revere um, was the one that's going to do the, the most famous picture, image of Boston Massacre, and we're going to look at that in a minute. Anyway, so you have the tensions being flamed by the Sons of Liberty towards the British. You have some economic issues and people that were wanting jobs, then being tensions between the soldiers and that being blamed. And then we'll see Paul Revere, clearly this connection to the Sons of Liberty. Um, he was one as well and, and how he wanted the Boston Massacre to be uh, portrayed and played out. So... Uh, most likely what happened is he had a group of colonists that went to hassle the British, uh, I can't say soldiers. Okay, went to hassle the British, British soldiers um, that were at the docks, that were near the docks. They... Uh, it was near an area of where some of the near location they were stationed or housed really it wasn't as much stationed as housed and somewhere along the way with all of this they start not only you know trading insults but throwing rocks and snowballs probably started off with snowballs before rocks <laughs> uh, and then supposedly this of uh, the rocks and snowballs led to bricks and other things somewhere in the chaos uh, someone we don't they don't know who yelled fire Right, and this led to shots being fired. And colonists killed. Right, so then from this, you what you end up having is the soldiers end up arrested and on trial. John Adams actually is the one 
who represents them. He's their lawyer. And what you get is that um, several of the, most of them were found not guilty. But you had two um, that were convicted of, of manslaughter. But ultimately, the British sent them home. And this did also piss off the colonists who saw it as escaping justice. So it certainly doesn't help this part here of family family, though it probably was fair considering what happened. Um, this certainly creates so put here the Boston porns of the best Boston massacre as far as what it leads to is that it uh, pushed more colonists over to the side of wanting independence. Okay, and let's look at the picture. So with this picture, this is Paul Revere's uh, image. <laughs> and some of the things that we can look at this, and this one is the Thang Link one. You can go, um, there's a link provided um, where you can actually, if I actually go off this for just a second, um, you should be able to cm oh i because it's still thinking here because i went off of it but there's all the different links make sure you click on those it gives you the text descriptions of some of the key points um if you don't want to go back through this lecture afterwards and you're trying to make sure you can talk about the the this picture uh there's a video uh to watch so lots of good stuff that way uh right now of course it's thinking Stop. Okay, well, I'll go without and I'll mark it up afterwards. So, one of the first things with the engraving is the title The Bloody Massacre. Uh, Paul Revere again created this with the sense of propaganda and it was very intentional in that. Uh, it was, it was, that was, it was exact purpose was to, to evoke essentially a sense of outrage that the British had intentionally fired on the colonists, um, without care or in fact glee while the poor colonists who did nothing were victims of this. So how we see that in here, one, the title, the bloody massacre, right? That alone it, it evokes this idea then you have uh, the soldiers here. Um, you have the captain to the right. He is lifting his sword, which would be ordering them to fire. The other key thing is that they're standing in uh, a line. That's not going to let me add that till the, <laughs> the internet can be figured out, apparently. Uh, so they're standing in a line. It's nice and straight. There's no one behind them. They're not in danger. And in fact, the guy, the guy on the, the far left, the soldier on the far left is smiling and looking very happy with himself. So that's important because what it tells you ultimately is this, that like I said, what he's trying to present, they're hap that one, that one guy's just happy about it, but they certainly weren't in danger. There's, they've got plenty of room behind them. Um, you have the guy ordering an attack and, uh, you know, the colonists are standing there not attacking. In fact, the one guy has his back to the, the individual shooting. Uh, you have, a, you know, even the poor dog is in the picture. Uh, the suggestion is that, um, 
this woman, this is a woman here, and I, I got it back up. Sorry for that break there. One, my kid came in and had to talk, of course, because I'm recording, <laughs> but also I figured I'd get it back up. So again, with it, you have the title, as I mentioned here, you have the um, individual um, ordering it. Oh, and you can see the icons for thing link, right? So these were the things that you could, uh, hold your cursor over and select on. I have it, uh, frozen to draw on here so it doesn't work. Um, and read the different text or watch a video or see the, another image of that. So here he is ordering the attack. This is important. They're all in a line. There is an also, if you look back here, no one behind them. Okay. And then this guy is a uh, happy, he's smiling. Now, if you look over the colonacy, poor dog, uh, here, this guy has got his back turned. You know, gosh, he's helping the injured, helping the injured. This, uh, some suggestions say it's a woman. Either way, you can see this is the, I call it the oh dear pose. You know, putting the hands together, looking, fretting, not sure what to do. Here you have people that have just, the, the showing the death. Uh, but there, no one is attacking. No colonists attacking. Okay, so all of this is meant to portray very specifically with the Boston Massacre, the um, issues with the, the fact that the British were intentionally trying to fire on these poor colonists. And it, I mean, even, even in this stuff here, it talks about it kind of, of reiterates that in the writing. So that is what, this is the most, this was not the most accurate, but it was the one that got printed and passed around the most, and it did do what um, Paul Revere had hoped, which was to cause outrage, uh, fan the flames of, of pushing for revolution, and and having the British narrative be that they were these, you know, the evil individuals that enjoyed uh, attacking the colonists and, and certainly chose to and see, this is what the British does. This is why we need to, you know, be free of this tyranny in that sense. So go back to that. So that's the Boston Massacre of Paul Revere's image. Big one there. Uh, if you do the thing link, it shows you an image that was done later, which was more based on testimony. And again, what it shows is a much more chaotic scene. The potential that the soldiers were surrounded on both sides uh, you ha you don't have them all just lining up happily firing, and the colonists definitely did fight back, and st and even before the shots were throwing things at them. So, yeah, how how it got to them shooting because well, someone in the crowd yelled fire. Both sides argued it was the other side, um, and we don't know. Nonetheless, it wasn't quite as neat uh, or or uh, obvious, if you will as Paul Revere made it out to be. All right, so the next one we have is going to be then the T Act. Remember with the Townsend, um, you had the T Act was not repealed. Uh, so this, this harkens back to the Townsend Act. And then uh, everything was the T Act was not repealed even though everything else was so the T act here has to do with the East India Company and the East India Company was connected and governed and controlled by the, the British uh, they all and many uh, individuals had invested heavily in the East India Company 
they uh, did various things. East India Company had had dealings in China. They did tea. Uh, they had opium um, dealings as well. Um, it had suffered some problems. So had some money problems. And ultimately, uh, the hope was the British government that they could help revive the East India Company because it was such a big facet for their uh, empire, for um, the different trade routes, and of course, just the fact that a lot of wealthy known people had investments in it. Uh, a lot of actually people in general had investments in the stock and in the East India Company. And so the the ho the thought was we can help them out and maybe help help with um, tea uh, and selling with it to the American market, um, basically giving tax cuts and exemptions so that they could give a cheaper price to the American tea market. So what they basically said is that you can bypass the merchants and. Uh, taxes that remember the Townsend Act for T and instead sell it directly to the uh, people and the American market and for which would allow for a cheaper price than anyone um, having to pay the tax. Right. This doesn't go over well either. <laughs> At this point, uh, anything the British do is going to piss off the colonists. I mean, that's, that's just the, the fact of it, isn't there? No matter, they cannot win here. And I mean, this one's... I get this one's more shitty. You know, you kind of read through some of them, you're like, oh, that sucks. You know, with the Townsend Act, it was really an attempt to try to do what the columnist said was okay. And then they're like, no, just just don't even do anything. And here, um, this one was more of a, a little bit underhanded as far as trying to help out uh, the monopoly that they had, the East India Company had, and making sure it didn't falter. And I get the understanding of not wanting the business component to falter, but uh, certainly... Um, gave favor to them over local merchants and others who were understandably pissed. Uh, again, the tea tax itself wasn't new. It was the fact that the East India Company was able to bypass it. Uh, and what you have is the Sons of Liberty once again get involved and are going to first actively protest the the tea tax and then of course we're going to have the boston tea party uh with the your voices of freedom you have the protest uh right with let's see it, it was it's called association of the new york sons of liberty Right, and this is page 91 in Voices of Freedom. And this, uh, the association of, if you have Voices of Freedom, that's page 91, um, of New York Sons Liberty basically goes through, and I'm not going to look at it because it's, it's decently long, but it, it talks about the first part of why the tax, why, not the tax, but why what they did with the T Act and the East India Company was not okay. So the whole thing is a setup first for why um, the East India Company and Tea Act was not okay. And then they create a set of resolutions and this is I wanted to point out because we looked at last time the one before with the Virginia resolutions and the Stamp Act and the first four that they approved and the last three that they didn't and why looking at the language and tone 
So with the resolutions here, the tone is different. Again, it is the Sons of Liberty, so they're more radical. Uh, but the the all there's five five total resolutions, and they've numbered them here for you. This one, the the Stamp Act didn't have numbers. This one, they they uh, helpfully numbered. And the best this what they basically do with this is the first one is saying if you sell um, or help out in any manner, uh, you're an enemy of the state. Two, anyone assisting or la in the landing or carting of tea is an enemy to the liberties of America. If you sell or buy it, uh, you have, um, you'll be called an enemy to the liberties of America. And then they say that whether it's the, what, no matter what it is, duties on tea um, paid by Great Britain or America, our liberties are equally affected. And that whoever shall transgress any of these resolutions, we will not deal with or employ or have any connection with. So then they, it's exile. So the first three, numbers one through three, basically says if you have any dealings with, England and T, you are enemy of liberties of America. I mean, using the word enemy is a pretty harsh, like, it's a, that, it, it's a much more serious charge. And then the fourth, number four, basically just says that um, any duties, import, uh, taxes, or taxes, etc., any duties, taxes, etc., uh, impact, uh, affect liberty. And then C, for the last one, sorry, so number five, if you break these resolutions and deal with T, <laughs> then you will not be dealt with. Equals you. And what not be dealt with like I said, it really is this, this, uh, ostrac ostracism. So it's not exile exactly. I said exile before, but they aren't sending them away. But ostracism is a good word for it as far as that. We're just going to pretend you don't exist. We, you, you are no more. <laughs> this is a lot harsher. And I think that's important to, um, recognize with this is that the response by the Sons of Liberty and we got, time has come by. The Stamp Act happened, happened several years before. Okay, so that is important to note with this is that the Stamp Act was before. And so it, it you know, the sentiment several years ago was not as eager. And they made that clear to jump into a war or a revolution. So now, you know, several years down the line, you have a much harsher tone. It also is the Son of Liberties. There were still plenty of people who were like, no, 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 we should not be trying to go down this path. You know, that like, or revolution is the last resort uh, with that. Whereas they, uh, the, they Sons of Liberty have been pushing for it for a while. Of course, you also had the Boston Massacre at this point. So more people were supportive of this, which is probably part of the reason why the language got through. One, it was the Sons of Liberty rather than like the local government, but two, also the, you know, we are moving closer to the declaration here. And because of that, you have more support for this and people willing to be more brazen about the language that they're using. But I, like I said, I want you to pay attention to the difference between, you know, go back and look at the, the rest Virginia stamp, uh, act resolutions and how the, the wording they use there, plus the three that they chose not to, you know, there, there was because of this similar wording. And then now you have the sense of liberty and you have this wording. And then we're going to look at the resolutions on the intolerable blacks and look at that wording because all of that is important for what's going on. All right. So the sense of liberty write this and it's all leading up to the Boston Tea Party. Uh, very much so. This The whole resolutions were a bit, you know, you're going to have nothing to do with it. And we're going to, you know, show them. <laughs> and 
they because uh, one of the things that this resolution is talking about before was that no one was willing to bring the ships. So if you read the first, like, so I just, we just went over the resolutions. But if you're reading the Sons of Liberty stuff that they're doing elsewhere, it mentions, like, none of the American ships were willing to bring the tea in. They're creating a blockade. And and so it's talking about those early steps prior to the Boston Tea Party. And that was, and that was part of it, is that they had basically told them they didn't, um, that they shouldn't be bringing in the tea, um, it was made clear that the ships were not welcome. And it mentions that American ships refused to bring in the tea. So ultimately, when a ship got through to dock, you had, uh, in, was it December 16th, 1773, uh, you had the colonists dressed as Indians board the, um, the ship and they dumped out all the tea into the harbor. Thus the tea party. Now this is going to trigger the intolerable acts, which we'll look at in just a minute. And we'll explain why. And well, here's part of the reason. They dumped out all the tea of the harbor they estimate that it's about four million dollars worth today in value that was a lot of money and a lot of money for a company that was uh at risk of going bankrupt they don't recover from this like this basically doomed them in that process and so understandably understandably england's pissed like you keep fighting us you keep causing problems we're trying to do these different things to help out this one lowered the freaking tea for you could have gotten tea cheaper what is your deal and you dumped out and ruined four million dollars worth of of tea let's say what it was ten thousand pounds back then which is equivalent of four million today this of course then is not surprising why then you have the intolerable acts that get established by uh, as a response this was a direct so we'll put that here, direct response to the Boston Tea Party and the anger at and I would say the anger too at the constant back and forth back and forth that every time they put something out um, you have the uh, colonists protesting and causing issues. It's like a child, right? They throw a fit. Okay, okay, fine. We'll stop. And then the children are like, woohoo! And then you try to impose a rule again. And then the children throw a fit. And then, of course, the parent doesn't stay their ground. And say, okay, 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 we'll stop. This is, I mean, it, it's not it's not that simplistic. But it's what it looks like. It's just, if you look from the, the Stamp Act, right? Here's a rule. And the col uh, that's the parent, and the, the colonists of the children say, no, no, it's not okay. And so the British, as the parents go, okay, okay, we'll, we'll take it back. And then they try again with the Townsend Act, and, 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 have, and have actually, like, done what the child wants and tried to do what they said they were okay with, and the child throws another fit. No, 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 okay, okay, we'll stop, right? So, of course... You, you know, what did you, ex they didn't, you know, what should you expect? You, you constantly are repealing what you're putting forth. Well, as soon as they protest, you're going to, they're going to keep protesting. Um, this, the Intel Blacks is like the final, I've had it up to here with you. We're done. Go to your room. You're grounded forever. That, that's what the Intel Blacks are like here. So they, what they specifically did, and these were, um, significantly more, they just targeted colonial government economics 
and social. Okay, so this is important because you have basically these three here, the government, economics, and social. It's like, let's let's make sure we target every single component of that life. So the first thing that Parliament did is they closed uh, down the port of Boston. There's the economic, right? The port of Boston was closed until the T was paid for. The second thing that they did um, was that they basically uh, stopped uh, town meetings, um, specifically changing the Massachusetts Charter to do so. Right, so here, um, government, so let's do this. Economic, boop, boop. government, there was another government one. They not only stopped the town meetings, except I think they got like one uh, periodically, but it, you can't govern or do anything with one meeting a year or whatever. And then the governor was allowed to appoint members of the council. Point members council. Okay, and this had been done in the past by election. Was done. What's significant about this is that uh, in past, if the governor can choose, the governor is picked by the. This is government too. The governor is picked by the king or someone in England, right? And if he gets to choose members of the council, then this could have, this is serious impact for colonial representation. Look at that, serious impact. Because you just are gonna pick people that are going to support the crown that not necessarily have the best interest of, of uh, the town in mind. So uh, that is a serious one. And then uh, you have the, um, what they allowed is that uh, basically a revision of the quartering act. Revised that stated and this is social for sure, that soldiers uh, could, could now be lodged in private homes by the military, by placed by the military commander. Okay, now what's important about this, the uh, original quartering act it was that soldiers, so here, the old quartering act stated that uh, soldiers would be put up in empty warehouses, homes, locations by the town. So the town would pay for private expense. Um, but again, it's not people, individual personal homes. Now it's private homes. You want to guess where, whose homes? The military commander was like, okay, Johnson and whatever and who and you and you, you're going there, you're going there, you're going, this was intentional to stop the Sons of Liberty, of Liberty Homes, right? It was full on the people who, you know, which just was going to piss them off more. They're the more radical ones. The worst thing you can do is sit there and then force soldiers down. But the idea was, okay, we're going to quarter the soldiers in the home of the troublemakers. And then that way, it's a whole heck of a lot harder to cause problems. Uh, just kind of pisses them off in the process. So this, and um, you can see by the, the name, right, the intolerable acts. These were seen as a significant problem, if you will. Uh, to really, and, and somewhat for many, a final push of this is just completely unacceptable. 
Um, this this is now, you know, before we were complaining about economics in Texas, this is now trying to completely target uh, our our ability to govern. And many who had been saying, see, see, th this is exactly what we said the British were trying to do. And it wasn't what they were trying to do in the past. <clears throat> but it certainly reinforced that idea that they were trying to curtail things. Um, and it was, it was, a, it was an angry direct response to the Boston Tea Party and what, and what they screwed over there. It was, the problem was it was enough to push many people over the edge. And it certainly is then going to trigger with Continental Congress, which we're going to look at in a minute, as well as people being a more support, um, for revolution. Okay, what I want to look at, we're going to look at the uh, Farmington, Connecticut Resolutions on the Intolerable Acts. Let me just pull that up. Okay, so there we go. Let's look at, let's see here, the... This is the Farmington, Connecticut, and resolutions, uh, Farmington, Connecticut resolutions on the intolerable acts. And again, if uh, Voices of Freedom, it's page 94. Really, 95 is where you get into it, but it technically starts on 94. All right, so you have, again, the resolutions. This is mostly just what this one is. The first... Um, <laughs> okay, so these, these are... So I'm just going to read them because I think it's important, then I'll put, like, the main thing, right? One, this is the greatest dignity interest and happiness of every American to be united with our parent state while our liberties are duly secured, maintained, and supported by our rightful sovereign, whose person we greatly revere, whose government, while duty administered, we are ready to, uh, with our lives and properties to support. So this first one is important because it does establish, uh, you know, they're not fully treasonous yet. <laughs> We're not ready fully to, to overthrow the king. Because what it is saying is that um, we're happy. It is our desire and happiness and to be um, united with parent state, right? With, with Britain, with, what is it? With, uh, we'll say England is Britain, but whatever. Uh, as long as, right? They say while the, the word that they use is while our liberties, but it's the same thing. As long as liberties are being represented in So with this one, like I said, we want the 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 first one. They very intentionally said, you know, we would be happy to be united with our parent, you know, uh, country with with England, the British, as long as our 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 liberties are being represented. Which then, of course, the implication is that they're not. All right, the next one, number two, the present. This is, and from, and the, so the first one's all nice. The last four, uh, four are not. <laughs> uh, it says, present minister, the, the present ministry being instigated by the devil and led on by their wicked and corrupt hearts have a design to take away our liberties and properties and to enslave us forever. Um, <laughs> so what, uh, the current, the present ministry, the current, Uh, what government individuals are what a uh the devil and wicked devil 
wicked and corrupt. And B, their goal is to enslave. Okay, so then three, I'm going to go up there. Three is that the late act, which is the intolerable act, which their malice hath caused to be passed in Parliament for blocking up the Port of, Bo Port of Boston is unjust, illegal, and oppressive, and that we and every American are shares and in the insults offered to the town of Boston. So that the current government... uh pass what the 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 act that they passed the intolerable acts are same thing uh unjust illegal and oppressive And it's an insult, <laughs> right? That, 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 that too. They're insulted by this. Number four, this is even more, that those pimps and parasites who dare to advise their master to such detestable measures be held in utter abhorrence by us and every American and their names loaded with the curses of all succeeding generations. I like that. Just think about where we went from the Stamp Act and then the Sons of Liberty looked radical and then now you've got this with the pimps and, and parasites who dare advise. So the horrible people who advised parliament or and or the king they see they don't go as far as insulting the king anyone else is fair game the king still is not being insulted at this point we'll see that changes in the declaration of independence but which i guess if you're going out you might as go out with a bang they're, they're careful not to to uh like i said insult the king yet at, at all but everyone else is pretty bad that they are um, detestable, are detestable, and what? And everyone is cursing them. And future generations. I mean, that's harsh, harsh right there. Is cursing them and future generation. I mean, man, when you give a curse to someone and then the curse on you, your house, and your children. A, B, C, D, E. There we go. I know the alphabet here. <laughs> We're not back at C. I mean, this, that, that always is telling you it's extra harsh because they're cursing your future generations. Man, you know, you really screwed up if they want you and all, all your descendants to be cursed in the process as well. And then it says, we scorn the chains of slavery we despise every attempt to rivet them. We are the sons of freedom. This is important. So they're the sons of freedom. Scorn slavery. This is important. And any attempts to impose it on them. This language, and we'll see in the declaration again of, of slavery, sons of freedom language uh definitely was seen as uh what would be in for for slaves hopeful to slaves that it might include them not here specifically in the values and actions of revolution okay so we'll see it does not does not end up that way for everyone I mean for some it did and we'll see we'll, we'll look we're gonna look at this like the uh, things that are going on during the war um, that will be what's going on there but you do it is important you have this language over and over again about freedom, liberty, bonds of slavery, tyranny, that, that that fit perfectly with this idea that there would be some assumption that then slavery, actual slavery, would also be included in this. Like I said, we'll see it doesn't. 
but there was hope for that, that it would. Um, okay, so despise all attempts to um, slavery and everything else. So th this is significantly harsher. This also, sh they don't like the British at this point. The only person, right, in all of this, the only person not insulted was the king. And they're careful not to do it not to insult him so why because they're not uh, fully ready to do independence just yet and if you insult the king that's kind of it but this is this this but here i'll put that but do not like the british at this point and the government Okay, so it is important. We've seen a huge shift in how they're viewing uh, people. A huge shift in um, language and tone from the first one to uh, the reaction to the intolerable acts in the process. Um, okay. What we're going to do, let's see where we at with number four, Continental Congress. So, um, with the opposition and dislike of the intolerable acts, you had various areas that had largely stayed out of protest and discussion with this now wanting to be involved ready to um engage and act um and and so and you had a couple of things that that diff uh, happened you had um militemen um militiamen and minutemen uh kind of be created so militia uh, protests showing that they were willing to fight. Um, you had different conventions from towns uh, show up and, 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 and basically write their kind of protest like this one, uh, like the one we just saw with the Intolerable Act. Uh, and basically what they wanted to do was create, some of the leaders, was create a coordinated response to the Intolerable Act. And so Continental Congress was convened and was created and convened in Philadelphia that month, and it was meant to bring in the most political leaders from the, all, all the colonies. Georgia didn't show up, um, but all of the colonies that were willing to show up. And so this was met, oops, met as a response to intolerable acts. It's meant to create a, a more coordinated, this is important to um, reaction from all the colonies. Although as mentioned, Georgia did not attend, but all the others did. So what, why is this important? Because the coordinated idea is that you don't get coordinated crap from any of these colonies at this point. The colony's identity, colonial identity, was not unified before this. It wasn't a us versus them. It was individual colonies, right? Individual colonies was more important. So one of the things that the Intolerable Acts did is bring the colonies to together and see that they should be working in a more coordinated um, group, if you will. Um, okay, so the first Continental Congress they met um, and discussed uh you know what what they should do um and some of it was an argument that 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 they should be at least uh preparing 
for the potential for war. I didn't it it wasn't um a whole lot. Here we'll put this there. Should at least be ready for the potential for outbreak of war. Although they're not ready to to, to say that there should be a war at this point um, by any means. And then they agreed um, to endorse, endorse the Sulfic Resolves. So that the let's see we get do we have those on here? The the Sulfic resolves were also again addressing the intolerable acts, and and weren't as harsh though as the one we looked at. Uh, they didn't they didn't call them pimps and pros and parasites and everything else that way. But it still was arguing for that that what the the tall blacks were were unacceptable uh and needed to be um changed so they agreed to uh do that and then adopted the continental association um which had called to, to stop trade so let's see endorse the suffolk resolves and adopted Continental Association, which suggested stopping trade with Britain. Uh, and uh, except for some, a few things, but that was basically the idea of kind of like a, a boycott. Well, we won't trade with them. One of the things that taught, and where did this come from? This isn't surprising with this. This is Thomas Paine's. Common Sense, which is in Voices of Freedom, mentions this this idea. Look, we're valuable because everyone's going to want to trade with us. We have all these resources, and that makes a powerful statement. So it's not surprising that um, that that mentality and that idea is going around with the um, the idea of trade. Uh, in the process of, of the, now this is, um, before he's writing that, but it's the same ideas. And it's not surprising that that's, that's going around because you'll see, like I said, you'll see it reflected in Thomas Paine's common sense of that, that tray. We, we have this huge value and we should be using it. They're less likely to want to destroy us because of this as well. Um, okay. So, I mean, these were the big, the, the kind of things that they did. They also, I mean, it just, a lot of it was discussion about, um, getting potential resistance for, against, um, um, the British. Oh, sorry. Let's get rid of that. It's good to come up while recording, but there you go. Okay. Let me, let me delete that. Okay. Okay. So, sorry with the pop-ups there. Um, all right, we have um, Thomas Paine's Common Sense coming a little bit later, but this idea of the trade is passed around. We got that, the Continental Association. The suggestion that, there we go. Uh, other things that they should do, Suffolk Resolve, be prepared for outbreak of war. This is the militia, it will be Minutemen. Minutemen were the militia, but the, that they should be ready to fight in a minute's notice. So some of the things that, let's put it over here because this actually does lead to uh, issues with Lexington and Concord. The militia and Minutemen. If you, um are ready to fight in a moment's notice. 
you um, <clears throat> and the militia in general are going to have stocks or stockpiles <laughs> of weapons ready to go. Uh, drills and practice. They set up a warning system. And so the goal was that if something did happen, they'd be ready, which it does. At the uh, end of the Second Continental Congress, they agreed to the, con the Second Continental Congress agreed to meet again. Um, they by the time that the Second Continental Congress convened, um, when what 1775, they ended up having a conflict that broke out. Uh, where it started. So what number are we on here? Five. Conflict. The first was uh, in um, uh, Concord. This is going to be Lexington and, and, and Concord. Um, and you had soldiers march Concord. Um, this was near, um, it was, they marched from Boston to Concord. And they what they were looking for, this was on, what, April 19th, 1775. Uh, British soldiers were looking for the stockpile of weapons. And they want, and specifically to seize them. Uh, right. So what you had is riders from Boston when they heard this came and warned the militia, basically, uh, of the militia. This is the famous Paul Revere, the British are coming. Right, run. There was other people that were with him. He wasn't the only one. He just ends up being the most famously known and remembered. Uh, but it was to warn the local leaders of the troops' approach. They took up, so they did. They took up arms and resisted. This ended up uh, leading to skirmishes in Lexington. Let's we'll see, fighting, I mean, semi-fighting uh, ended up taking place in And then also in Concord, right? And so this these ended up being known as the... They weren't really battles that much, but the battles of Lexington and Concord. All right, and this, uh, you did, I mean, you had some people that were dead. They, they did shoot each other. The British did retreat to safe. They went back to Boston, so they ended up, the British soldiers retreated. They weren't expecting any resistance really so it was a bit of a shock but they did retreat to boston uh in the process this is also where uh the the line the shot heard around the world and in part because they knew that this was going to have significant consequence um and and is going to lead to ultimately independence you have with this, this, and then you have common sense and, and Thomas Paine's impact, um, certainly helped support. So for Leo, okay. What led conflict? Let's see. What led to declaration? All right. And we're going to look at the declaration here in just a second. And then that's, that's where we'll stop. Cause we're going to look at the actual war. After that, but what led to the, the, the declaration? Well, obviously, the taxation issues. 
but more importantly, the changing perception, changing view of the British and tensions between the two. Which the intolerable acts. Lexington and Concord and Thomas Paine played a huge role and I skipped because we really should have in there um, we'll put 2.5 <laughs> the Sons of Liberty played a huge role in that perception so it's part of two anyway so yeah these were the things that led to the Declaration of Independence, and we're going to look directly at the Declaration here in a minute. Um, Thomas, like I said, Thomas, the key with Thomas Paine's common sense was the idea of, in what was plain language, it wasn't overly frewy and fluffy to where it was difficult to read and understand that, and that's the key, is the average person could read and understand Thomas Paine's common sense. A lot of political works that were written during this time um are more highbrow if you will and the average person that wasn't was literate but not super literate in that sense he didn't have a, a huge education had, would have struggled to read and understand what's going on thomas Paine wrote it for every man to be able to uh, you know and every man some women were lucky enough to be able to read it but for, for men to be able to read it and understand it so that's one of the big things with common sense is that it was, it was plain language and simple to read. And then the arguments were persuasive. The idea of, of because, okay, so let's just put these down since I'm going over them. Plain language and simple to read. The other thing was that the, the we'll say good arguments. <laughs> Specifically, um, issues with, um, kingship and the nature of, uh, passing on, passing on rule based on birth. Right. So he argues, one of the things that he argues is looking at, um, the the issue with monarchy and the hereditary succession they've got the title on that which is, is is good but it's specifically saying this is what's wrong with kingship and more importantly when you pass on rule government rule to by because of birth and birth alone rather than merit there isn't issues with that um he introduces and talks about um abuse of power talks about the valuable attributes of America, specifically trade and value to the world, which again was the idea, look, we don't have to be afraid of, of over getting rid of our, our, um, our parent state, if you will, because we have this uh, structure with other people um, that will make us valuable that you know people want to trade with us we're not gonna flounder because we no longer connected to Britain even though they're powerful and then of course this this idea of, of parent child relationship right all children grow up and away from parents. <laughs> right, and so the argument being, we should be too. Um, it's not, why is it any different from that? Okay, now I wanna look at, I say number of those, we'll just do A here, the Declaration of Independence, and obviously the importance there. So you have all these things that influenced up to and leading to the Declaration of Independence. July 2nd, 1776, Congress formally declared. Right, so, oh, but if it's July 2nd, 
Why do we celebrate on the 4th? Because it was approved two days later. Formally declared independence. And, um, oops, sorry. And then two days later, on July 4th, it was approved. The Declaration of Independence, let's, let's, the, the key with this, I mean, it's a big thing, uh, because it, it shifts away this idea of the rights of Englishmen to the rights of, of people in general as a connection to independence. Um, it's going to set up, it basically what it does is it's the uh, reasoning for why uh, we are declaring independence. and the key rights that there that that we want okay so let's look at uh, no declaration of independence okay All right, the unanimous declaration of the 13th uh, United States of America, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impels them to separate. So what this first paragraph is just saying is, Right, when the course of human events, it becomes necessary to dissolve. When you have to do this, you should declare why. So we hold, the, and so then these essentially, right, this is saying, this is, we're saying why, the reasons, and the reasons are this list right here of what is important. Well, actually, actually two parts, the reasons and important. So this first part, um, this this paragraph are the values okay and this this other part is the list of offenses <laughs> it's basic it's actually it's like this is why you suck that's what i always like to say there right? uh here <laughs> this is why you suck <laughs> and why we're leaving all right so the first parts though here's here's the values for what we're doing we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and that these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Oops. Again, if we're looking at, this is that, we talked about that, that uh, freedom language that is going to look like slavery might not be part of that. So all men are created equal. You have certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. This right here was definitely influenced by um, the enlightenment period in, in Europe. This is very much that kind of philosophy of unalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. They originally supposedly wanted to put property, but realized that they couldn't like, wasn't necessarily an unalienable right and you couldn't pro provide that um but but these are important okay that this is this is what everyone has a right to life freedom liberty and at least pursuing happiness <clears throat> that to secure these rights governments are instituted among men so in order to make sure this happens governments are created right deriving their just power from the consent of the government of the sorry of the governed so here it's that to, in order to make sure that these rights happen, governments are created and approved by those who are being governed. All right. That whenever if any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute new government. Okay. So we'll just right there. This is saying 
if the government threatens these rights, it is the right of the people to overthrow it. The Declaration of Independence, and this gets so often ignored now because, of course, they don't want us doing it now, is a justification for overthrowing a government. And I mean, they have to be because they're overthrowing a government here. The Declaration of Independence is saying, this is why we're telling you, King, screw you, and we're not going to be a part of it anymore. So they, they, ha they are providing their justification for why they're overthrowing the government. And instead of saying, uh, and they did truly believe this, instead of saying like, well, we should throw overthrow it this one time, or only with kingship, it specifically says <clears throat> that if any form of government is destructive to the ends of providing for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, then the people should alter and or abolish it and institute a new government. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the revolutionary part right there is, is this, our Declaration of Independence is directly a document authorizing us still to this day, technically, that if, if we see the government being destructive of our inalienable rights that are listed that they saw as most important, we should be, or at least we have a right to, I guess they don't say you have to, uh, or that you, even that you should, but that we have a right to alter and abolish it and institute a new government. So, I mean, that's a pretty big, bold statement right there. All right. And then laying its foundation on some, such principles and organizing its powers to such a form as to them shall seem most likely to affect safety and happiness. So, I mean, that just, you know, so once you've altered it and or abolished it, setting it up to make sure that it follows this, right? Prudence, indeed, will dictate... That government long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. Now this is this is like they realized, oh crap. Hmm. We're advocating overthrowing a government and then saying that you should do it again, or at least you have the right to do it again if they're destructive of these. But we we don't want them just people willy nilly like that. Okay, overthrow, overthrow. So they throw in there, right? Will dictate that the government's long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. You guys don't go around screwing with things just for little minor issues, especially governments that have been established. So they do throw in there, like, okay, don't be stupid. You d you don't overthrow a government for dumbass reasons. Okay, you that that's just just have to throw that in there. So that you didn't think we're saying, you know, every time you're pissed at the government, start a new one. And experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms from which they are accustomed. And then they, but then they throw in there like, but it does show most people were willing to suffer through these um, issues over... Um, just overthrowing. Nonetheless, like I said, it is the caveat on there to make sure it's like, but we're saying overthrow things, but do it carefully, please. And while we say that most people are willing to suffer through these things, we just want you to be aware of it. Uh, but when a long train, okay, so then it says, but here's back to why we're, <laughs> so that was like a, that was definitely a forethought into the future of people reading this and going, oh, sweet. I'm pissed at the government. Let's overthrow them. It's what the declaration says. And then, but then it does, it goes, but... Now it's going back to us and why we're doing this. Because they do. They have to explain and justify what, what's going on. But when a long train of abuses and urs usurpations pursuing invariably the same object invents a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. That was a big word that gets used. And we'll see it actually again later. A despot. So, I mean, this is they're, they're arguing that, right, it's been a long train of abuses um, and that they've attempted recourse then, but when it, when it creates despotism, a, a, a cruel in, individual ruler who abuses and, uh, you know, is a harsh ruler that doesn't, you know, takes away liberties, then it's your right, it is your duty to throw off such government to provide new guards for the future security. So here is a crazy thing, right? I am out of space to to mark this, but 
it is your duty. I want to emphasize that it's your duty to throw off the government. Before they say, they don't say it's your duty. It's the right of the people. However, they get more specific. If a government ends up in despotism and here, let's put it. So if one, actually, let's go back to here because I can do it on here. I don't have any more space. So the Declaration of Independence is one justification and explanation of uh, overthrow of Britain. Okay. Um, and then they, they establish the main rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of, of happiness. Uh, the, the key, hang on, I'll go back here for a second. Excuse me. Woo. Um, I'll put that too. Okay. So the key with this is the, 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 of happiness, right? Is, is that, that everyone's equal, all men created equal, unalienable rights, that these are rights that can't be taken away. Okay. And then it suggests, you know, right to overthrow government, but be careful, <laughs> but be careful to not do it for minor reasons. But if despotism and oh, let's do it that way. I'm gonna put this over here before I turn it off at the last minute. And if it's despotism and you have tried to change it, then it is your duty to overthrow the government because despotism prevents the unalienable despotism prevents the unalienable rights from happening. That's the idea behind it. And, and I mean, they, so they do say though that you, if you've tried to, um, right. Long train of abuse. We've tried and, and then, and then you've tried to, to write it and they, they, they don't respond. So, so you throw off the government to provide new protection for future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies. Patient. See, we have tried and now as necessary constraints to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and receptions, all having direct object, this, uh, and direct object to the establishment of absolute tyranny over the States. So, and to prove it, Here's our list of crap. <laughs> okay, so then the key uh, is current king is a tyrant. Um, uh, well, c c current king is practicing tyranny. That, and uh, limiting rights. And therefore list of ways the king sucks <laughs> it, it, list of because uh, they do they to prove it here's the list right he has refused to assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good he has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent blah 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 he obstructed the administration of justice. He made judges dependent on his will alone. 
He created new offices and sent them to harass our people. He has kept on us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He's combined with other subjects to us a jury and jurisdiction foreign to our constitution. Quartering the large bodies of troops. They don't like the troops there. For protecting them by mock trial. Oh. Uh, Boston Massacre. That's what that one is. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. Taxes. Taxation. Without representation. Right, these are all things we've talked about. Um, although they do a couple others. We're depriving us of, uh, with, uh, in many cases, without the benefits of trial by jury. Uh, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretend offenses. Suspending our legislatures and tolerable acts. Anyway, the point is you can read through it and stuff. Um, and then in every stage, we've petitioned and tried to redress these issues. Again, they make it clear. We tried to get change. This was not, this isn't something we jumped at. So the list of the ways the king sucks, which are largely have to show the various conflicts we've discussed. This point. Taxation quartering, trade, tolerable acts, etc. Okay, and then and then they they reaffirm that they attempted to address and fix issues first with the king first. But because that did not happen, they now have to declare independence. All right, so prior to the key, the, and then of course the independence is important because I mean, it, it wasn't, the British didn't expect this at all. Um, with Lexington and Concord, it was, it's skirmishes, it's skirmishes. And, and you could even argue, even with the Declaration of Independence, once the independence is declared, many thought that this would be quick and then it, things would go back. So this, this is the, uh, for the British, uh, I mean, the Declaration of Independence is a big thing because I mean, it's technically treason. Uh, and if you don't win, it's treason. <laughs> and, and, and they did, they, they said, um, you know, we either, we, um, we stick together or we hang together is kind of this, this statement that gets thrown around there. Um, when this is signed, um, again, that we, okay. You know, basically men, we, we all must now stick or hang is to plane off the word hang together. Men, we must all now hang together or we surely will be hung together because then the key with this, right, is the declaration is technically treason but i like that statement we it's not this is not not an exact quote <laughs> i don't remember it 100 percent, but it's very close but close okay we all must now hang together or we surely will be hung together and it's this is this is that recognizing that uh, idea of treason and the fact that they get better. They're they're in it now. You're in it together. You're putting your name on this. I mean, it certainly was a, a a bold thing to put your name on this too, because it was it was suggesting that technically it's treason. You win, you're fine. Obviously, see, we won. This doesn't you know they don't get uh, hung for treason. But if you didn't, the king certainly was going to be looking for who are the instigators to this revolt. And you've got the list, the Declaration of Independence, with the list of names of the people who were. The other thing is that the, the um, we'll see as the war starts, the British really don't think this is going to be a huge deal. And then what? They were the strongest military in the area uh, uh, for that part of the world at this time. The colonists were not. So <laughs> you go, we're going to crush you. 
this is going to be ridiculous. We'll be in and out in a couple days. Which, you know what? Anytime anyone says in wars, this will be short, don't believe them. Because history has shown over and over again, they're never short. <laughs> it's never a quick war. Just don't assume it is, ever. You should know. Maybe it will end up be, you know, one of these times. But I would just never, ever assume when someone says that that's the case. Because they say it here, too. The British say, it's going to be quick. We'll be in. We'll crush them. They didn't really see it as even a full-blown independence. Even with the Declaration, there was some view that, um, and especially prior to the Declaration, this is just, these are just squirmishes. You know, they're discontent, and it's not okay. But we'll put this back, and then things will go back to the way they were, you know, supposed to be. Um, with the Declaration of Independence, and then as the war progresses, and the British realize, oh, they're serious... <laughs> they then change their tune. But so we're going to look at that. The next thing, the next lecture is looking at the actual war during the war, um, the home front, women's roles in the war, various issues uh, with, with Native Americans, um, slaves and the free black population and their views on, on the war, um, the South versus a little bit of the North, those type of things. So we're going to be looking at the war culture and structure um, during the Revolutionary War, looking at, of course, George Washington, and um, you have the Continental Army, and then you have the militia, and they function very differently. So that's it for today, um, and we'll be looking at the actual war next time.